We're going to start, though, with a current player that, if things go a certain way, will not be a current player by the end of the summer. And that is with Frankie de Young. Abbas asks, is a potential sale of de Young to reduce wages so they can re- register the new free agent players or to use the money to buy players? And how many players are they planning to buy with 80 million euros? Is this a good idea? Well, that's a good question. I think, I think it all comes down to ultimately, you know, that number 80 million is 80 million euros a real number is this is that a potential that we actually might see a real offer from so maybe united as it's been rumored uh or any other club that might actually want someone like uh fdj um and that that's going to really i set the tone i think it really just sets the tone in general is to is that if you get an offer like an 80 million plus type offer, then I think you know, my first gut reaction is as much as I love Frankie and I want him to succeed with us is you have to entertain it. You just have to. Um, as a club, you know, in the financial state that we're in, there's you've got to entertain it. And the reality is um, he's probably going to go. And now, what are you going to do with 80 million if it's 80 million? Um that's a very good question. You know, do you use 40 million to go replace him? And then 40 million goes to pay off debt and, you know, and say, okay, here you go, Javi, you got to, you get to work with this player now and you just help the club save X amount of dollars. Um, Or like to his question, can, can, do you go out there and spend 80 million, which I think is the foolish answer. I, I just think that's the foolish response is if you're going to sell them, the, the goal is to help the club out and to financially, it, it's got to be a win-win. It's got to be a win for Javi and the team and a win for the club financially. So whatever, the, whatever happens. Well, yeah, I don't want to concern people, but the club is in over 1 billion euros of total debt and 80 million, unfortunately, is just a drop in a hat of that number. So Frankie de Young being sold for 80 million is not to pay off long-term debt, but a reminder that so much of Barcelona's issue that is not the issue with Juventus or Manchester United or Tottenham or these other clubs with major, major debt, I mean, even Real Madrid, who have to have these major long-term debts, so much of Barcelona's is due in the short term. That is why it is still code red. And that is why we'll say the future obviously looks a lot brighter because if Barcelona can figure this out and navigate through what is probably another year and a half or two or three transfer windows of really having to pinch the pennies, then they're going to be in good shape because again, so much of their pain is in short-term debt, uh, short-term debt. And that said, I get the sense that Frank Young would be sold in a Griezmann and Messi way in that he will be sold to register players. And I get the sense that again, that debt, that 80 million would just go right towards short-term debt. And it would go right towards making sure that Barcelona could well, CVC deal might change. This is all changing per the hour. But if Barcelona does agree to Tebas' version of a CBC, uh, CVC deal, there's also a part of that that he might be a little more amendable to work with them on that, that wage limit. And with Frankie de Young's wages off the books, he's one of the top five highest earners on the team. That's going to make it a bit easier to quote unquote, you know, uh, not quote unquote, but to get under some kind of arbitrary number that I don't even think has been worked out yet. Is that I know that was a confusing and convoluted answer, but yeah, to me, I get the sense that if Barcelona don't have to sell them again, they won't just because you cannot replace, even if you can ask questions about, oh, he doesn't fit, or we have other questions we're going to get to the Busquets thing now. But even if Frank Young, quote unquote, doesn't fit at the moment, it's it, you still are in a really rough spot to sell a player and even an asset like that at this moment when other clubs know that you're kind of being forced to sell that asset. Like if they were going out and making the phone calls themselves, sure. But I think they're just receiving calls for Frankie de Young and they're saying, hey, we got to entertain these because we have to pay off short term debt. And we also want to register, you know, if they're saying that we want five free agents or four, four free agents and one 30 million euro player, then de Young's got to go so we can reinforce our squad that way. And that's a calculus that's going on. Um, so I think that answers that one pretty astutely. Uh, Vic, for the next one, Eamon and Polkett with a similar question here about Busquets. Will Busi play all games again next season without rest? Or do you think Xavi will play his 3-4-3 and we'll see a bit of Busquets being, we'll say, sent, uh, sent to the bench a little bit more. And you can also add to this, Vic, probably the only breaking news we have here is that Busquets did say in the media a few hours ago that, hey, the club hasn't really asked me to take a salary reduction and I'll talk to them if they want to, but they haven't said anything. Instead, they're asking questions of me in the media. And, you know, it's not great. 
I think we've been here before where Barcelona's captain isn't a fan of the board. The only difference is that not even the board, but of the club itself. But the problem there is that Bartomeu against Messi is a lot different than Laporta uh, potentially against Busquets. But I don't think that's what's happening here. I just think that's a little bit of, you know, friendly fire shots, if you will, in the media. Yeah, he seemed a little, I mean, he, he took point to the being slightly and you know annoyed annoyed but in a, I think his response was was clean in that you know why am I hearing about you know renewals or taking pre- uh, reductions in my salary at this point from from you like this isn't this isn't where I should be hearing this from at this point is basically what he was saying you know but he's willing to help the club in any way shape or form so very good answer um and, you know, will he take a reduction? Will they ask him to take a reduction? I'm assuming everybody's a- at risk of being asked to take reductions. We've already been, we've seen it for over 12 months now. Um, but to answer the question about, are we going to see him play every minute, every, every match again? Well, I think that's the, the problem we've seen year after year after year. You hear, and you hear it from people like, uh, even from Lucho, uh, from the Spanish team, at the end of the day, there's no one better in the role. And so until, so how, how do you, what do you do when you've got someone, as long as he's, you know, his ankles are working and he's, he's on the pitch and he's, he's functioning, you put him out there. He's going to be the one to do it. But uh, how do we give more minutes to somebody else to prove themselves in, in a, in a, in a system uh, to replace him? That's just, that's a, that's a hard, uh, you know, and I think hard pill to, to uh, swallow when, in fact, the whole year we were trying to play catch up, right? If we're more competitive throughout the year and we're staying close, you know, within, you know, five or six points of Real Madrid throughout the season, I think, you know, again, maybe you can take more risks and try to introduce somebody else. But when you're pl- trying to play catch up and trying to make sure you even get into the Champions League, um, yeah, you, he's just, he's still your answer. It's interesting because he is 33 right now. He'll be 34 next month in July. And I I think speaking of the financial part of it Mm -hmm. first, I think the club ideally, and it might be the best case scenario for everybody, is that they take what is remaining of his salary and they extend it potentially for two seasons where he has one year left on his deal. His contract is up in June of 2023. And I know that takes him a 35, but the caveat here is that, again, Busquets led the team with 50 appearances this year. He was the only Barca player to hit 50. He played 4,300 minutes behind only Ter Stegen's 4,350, and he was their Iron Man. He also, unlike Messi and unlike Iniesta, who, not to say that, I mean, they're both still playing, by the way, <laughs> you know, and uh, Iniesta at his age is still playing, but they also did have some major injuries, which maybe didn't take years off the back of their, their careers, that being Messi and Iniesta, but it may have taken away some of their best years extended, if that makes any sense. And Messi only had a year or two of those. I mean, yes, it was, uh, again, yes, only had about a year or two, but Busquets has truly never really had that injury that's going to hamper him here in his mid thirties, like, like that. So if he continues to stay healthy the way he is, he can, he's just durable. Some players are guys are just durable and they can keep going. Same thing with Lewandowski, the guy, I mean, he missed the two months and Byron's season kind of went a little bit haywire, especially in the champions league, but the guy's generally healthy. And as far as the reducing the wages thing, he is first in the team and being paid like an absolute superstar at almost 425,000 K per week, that being in euros. So certainly that number could be brought down and you add an extra year on the back end. And I understand how the club doesn't want to mortgage their future with what they owe PK, what they're going to owe Alba, what they owe Busquets in the next few seasons when they will no longer be Barcelona players. But again, their big problem here is short-term debt and not long-term debt. And they don't want to continue to have to deal with long-term debt, but that might be the best case scenario, especially if Busquets is still able to give you two years. I mean, you don't know what he's going to be able to give you. And I know people, I know the response immediately is going to be get him out of my club or he's slow and the club needs to move on. And there needs to be a contingency plan. That's absolutely true. But I keep going back to it, that trying to figure out who can replace his understanding of the game his pace, I mean, the way he, not his pace, but <laughs> the way that he controls the pace of a game. <laughs> Certainly you can easily, easily um, replace his pace with, with a hoagie or a, <laughs> you know, a, a lunch meat sandwich, but, but you cannot replace his understanding of the game and the way that he just controls and dictates that midfield, uh, especially when he's at his best. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think the financial thing is going to dictate the on the field thing, just because we'll see if he does take that salary reduction and if he does reduce it, and extends it again for two years or whatever, then Barcelona have less to pay on the back end, if you will, uh, or if they're able to, again, extend that out the way they're doing with Umtiti, 
then mm -hmm. whatever he gives you is what he gives you. Whether he's a, if he's getting paid like a starter, he has to be a starter. And if he's not getting paid like a starter, he doesn't have to be. Speaking of not a starter though, and sticking in the midfield, Vic, from Matt and Parr, they both asked about Nico because I, you know, after he got hurt, I didn't really bring him up a lot because he was injured for the rest of the season and that was it. So do you think we should loan him for a year to get more minutes, seeing as he's probably the fifth or sixth on the midfield depth chart behind Pedri, Gabi, Busi, Frankie, and Kessier? Uh, and then to follow up that, is he a legit long-term option at pivot? And if not, why do you think Xavi might not think so? I think just, I think a lot of things are going to dictate, you know, where, what we see with Nico. And the one thing we saw initially was, okay, we see him as uh, a potential in January. We we signed him, get, moved him up to first team, put, slap 400, oh, at 500 million on him for a buyout clause. So we, we secured him. So we, that was the first step. The second step is, okay, where does he fit as what we're asking now? And as we look at that, you think about the fact that Ricky is most likely going to be making an exit, you, you would think, uh, at this point. And so if, if you've got one of your backup mid Fielders, you know, who's making an exit, then there definitely is room for him, you know, on, in the squad. I don't see him, I don't see at this point that a, uh, unless of course they bring in, uh, what is it, his uh, a kissy, a kissy? Well, I don't even know his name. Yeah, um, from AC Milan. Yep. If, if we bring in another okay. midfielder, then that might put him, you know, you know, to the side where he's not going to get the playing time. And then you have to send him somewhere. Uh, if FDJ, leaves Frankie goes then you absolutely again need to bring someone in and he likely is not leaving because you need to utilize you need midfielders um so I think a lot of things are going to happen at the you know at the Frankie side whatever happens with him is going to dictate a lot and then do we bring in a Kessie uh may dictate as well what happens and then of course what happens with with Ricky so uh at this point I think uh, I think just not enough information we're not far enough through the summer uh to to, to see where those chips are going to fall well with in the case of kessier he's coming no matter what uh, he and christensen will be arriving they've already agreed personal terms and their free transfers the matter is whether or not they will be able to be registered so if those two cannot be registered then they're going to be sitting from the sidelines the way that luis suarez did when he arrived and he's just waiting to be registered till January. And so you're going to see a similar thing from Kessier and Christensen mm. if they're unable to be registered. And in that's the case, then you definitely keep Nico, see where he, how things shake out and you wait till January to potentially loan him. Uh, or again, in the preseason or Frankie being sold, of course, is number one. If Frankie sold, then even if Kessier comes, if Kessier doesn't really eat up the minutes the way that Frankie de Young does, uh, Kessier is a valuable rotation piece, but if Frankie de Young is there, he's going to eat up a lot of minutes. That's one of the things that he does well. Again, he's also very durable, even if he's had little one-off injuries uh, here and there. And so if de Young is gone, of course, Nico plus Kessier is remaining uh, because basically it's the same midfield as last year, except you're replacing Kessier with Frankie de Young. So again, that's eating up less minutes. So if anything, that's more minutes for Nico. Um, but if, yeah, if those five are all registered and all healthy, and again, that's a huge one because in the preseason, what if Busquets looks 34 and is 34? What if Pedri is hurt again? I mean, that is like the, the obviously worst case scenarios, but what if one of these guys goes down in the preseason or goes down in some of these international fixtures for extended amount of time? So you're, I agree with you that it's still a bit too early for Nico, but you know, all things considered, I think his agent, which is Jorge Mendez, certainly is going to have something lined up for him because again, that's an agent that does the work before the, you know, instead of waiting on the club. So I think they're going to have something lined up for him. I don't think it'll be, even if it's a sale, it's with a buyback. And I think the club would be silly to get rid of Nico because Nico is one of those where uh, the next uh, one of the questions in the future is about La Masia. But Nico is much like Gabi, uh, even much like Balde. He's one of the ones that played with the age groups above him. He was always one of the most promising in the academy. And if there are ones who are going to break through, it's going to be someone like Nico. Um, you know, he did play, as I said, 46% of Champions League minutes last year, being a valuable piece of the squad. And he's been being brought along very slowly by Xavi, which is a good thing from the bench coming on. So, yeah, I would in at least for this season, I would look to loan him to a La Liga side. I actually do think there's a few other midfield pieces from Barca B that you could fill in if Pedri or Gabi or Busi or Frankie or Kessier misses a game or two or three, you know what I mean? Like, or if Kayato's coming back, we have a question about him later, you move Kayato there into the midfield for a game or two until somebody gets back, right? Like there might be enough depth. And I would say to the Liga side, because 
I think you want him to adapt to that style. You want him to adapt to Spanish football. And if he plays pivot there, he plays pivot there and it works out. But regardless, you'd want him going to a team that at least on paper is going to want to press because at least from what we saw this season, one of his most advanced skills is pressing well, almost as a box to box midfielder. And that is going to what is going to get him on a La Liga side. That's when it get, what's going to get him minutes the way it got him minutes under Kuman and minutes under Xavi. So is he a long-term option to pivot? I'm not sure. There's only like an eight game sample size. And I watched six of those eight games at Barca B and he looked like he was confident and he looked good for Barca B in the third division last year <laughs> as a pivot. So like, I don't know. I mean, that's the answer. I don't know. His, he orients his body well sometimes, but then there are other times when he doesn't orient his body well, which is something that obviously Xavi, just like Cruyff, is at the top of that list. You've got to receive the ball perfectly every time. And it seems like he has an instinct to do it, but is that an instinct because he's been at La Masia since he was 10 years old? Or is that an actual instinct that he has that he's going to be able to take that up to the next level? And I don't think I have the answer to that and, until I do. Um, when, I, when I think about mid, we're talking a lot about midfielders, another midfielder that may come into the equation that could, you know, make it easier potentially for an ego move is that we've got another youngster waiting in the wings with Pablo Torre. So you've got yep, him who start coming in. So you, if you've got Pablo, uh, you know, is like, as your kind of safety net, like, Hey, things go wrong. We move Nico out, we get injuries. We brought in 17 year olds before 18 year olds before we're doing that in the recent 12 months, we could do it again, you know, with someone like him. Well, I don't mind too that he's 19 years old and was racing something there's best player. I know it's in the third division, but the Still. point is like, he was playing with first team and by first team, like he was playing with regular racing something there guys. It wasn't like a developmental team, like the purpose of Barca athletic. I got to get used to that. Vic. <laughs> the Barca, Barca B Barca athletic. I got to, I got to get used to it. So um, I guess uh, here's another one about the midfield. We're, we're going to stay, stay with the midfield. The next two questions as well. Uh, Stefan asks, uh, having watched Gabi at the junior levels and, you know, asking me that I have, is he, is his style of play different to how he plays now in the first team? And, you know, this is an interesting one because I didn't really think about this. Like I knew what Gabi did well, as in Gabi was better as a midfielder than everybody around him. He just passed better. He saw the game better. He saw the passing lanes better. He shut down space better defensively. He didn't have to, we'll say, be as physical and stand up for himself as he needed to play against 16 year olds. So like, yes, it's very different because he's constantly going out there now. Like he has something to prove because he does. He's 17. And, you know, that's what's keeping him on the field until those other skills, as in his superior technical ability, his finishing product, which he had a bit of in the in the lower levels. And again, this is playing against 16 year olds when he's 14 years old. So again, it was a bit ago, but when he's playing against guys who were kind of almost his size or just a little bit bigger and still kids themselves, you know, he was able to find that through ball that, you know, some of his through balls at that level at the U16s at the kid at Ah were just beautiful, just beautiful. Like you knew that this kid was special but he hasn't been able to adapt just there yet. And I always say yet, because again, he's 17 and we've seen him do it before. Now he just has to get used to doing it at a higher speed. And that can take, especially in La Liga playing for FC Barcelona, it's going to take a little bit to get accustomed to. It might take a year or two or three, and that's totally fine. Cause then he'll be 20 years old, <laughs> in three years. So, I mean, again, so Gabi, you know, to say that he's playing it differently. It, and yes, I think that's actually a great point in defense of Gabi. For those who said, well, he kind of blended in, he struggled in the last few games of the season. Sure, he did, but he's also adapting. And there's nothing as better proof for his adapt adaptation than having watched him at the U16s and now watching him with the first team. When I think, think of Gabi, I mean, I think about, it takes me back to one of the points of, I forgot about with Frankie was that when I think about like players that are staying, players potentially going, you know, one of the things we can, can, can compare to is like, you know, who are those, I hate using the word untouchables. I don't think anyone's really untouchable, but I think most cool will, will, will I mean, say I mean, that they, there we'll are say, there's like there's there's three. Pedri, Pedri's untouchable. Boosie's yeah. untouchable. As far as no, no, Ansu's untouchable, Pedri's untouchable, touchable. Rahul's untouchable. That's it. And Rahu. Okay, fair <laughs> enough. So when I think about like Gavi, from what we've seen from Gavi, is he trending towards a position where anybody want to see Gavi leave? Like, mm -hmm. I, I don't. I I think he's he's heavier weighted, more towards that untouchable uh, side of the equation than than even Frankie. Frankie is. I think we've seen such inconsistencies with him that 
I, I, if he leaves, I'll be like, okay, I wish him well. I'd rather him figure it out, but no one's proven. Not one of the coaches is proven to whatever the magic, you know, whatever the, they don't know how to unlock him and make him a consistent player match in and match out. And I think we're seeing more of that consistent player and trajectory with Gavi than I even see with Frankie, at least in this short term, like in this, this half a year. Um, and so when I think back of all the midfielders, who's going, who's staying, um, I, I, I can't imagine Gavi leaving. Well, that's a good point because I think to answer the same question for Frankie, when Frankie moved to Ajax to Barcelona now for multi, for four seasons, kool him and asking, where's the Ajax Frankie de Young, the one who was voted the seventh best player in the Ballon d'Or voting when they went to the semifinal at being Ajax. And the difference is that Frankie is just playing a totally different role and will continue to play a totally different role and just looks entirely different. Like his style of play that brings the best out of him is just not available. It's just not possible at FC Barcelona because he was the thing that made everything tick. And at Barcelona, a lot of different guys make things tick based on their, their skill set and their personality. And again, it's so much more about the system than it is what those, those stars can even do. Not that Ajax is an individual system because Ajax is well known as well for being very much like Barcelona, a very similar system. That's why there was so much hope that he was going to be able to go from one system to another system that, again, it's a lot like looking in the mirror sometimes. Formations may be different, but the principles between Ajax and Barcelona have always, yeah, again, I also have Johan Cruyff on the mind after I did that piece last week, but it's different from Gabi because, again, Gabi's coming from Barcelona's system and trying to play in Barcelona's system from Xavi, who's again, just Barcelona dogma and La Masia dogma. And so it's a bit, we'll say, easier of a transition for me to understand that Gabi can get his old style of play in the academy and bring that to the first team in a way that if Frankie hasn't brought his Ajax self yet, I, it, you're right, like it's probably not going to happen. So speaking of the midfielder, though, Vic, that's clearly going to overtake both of them. I say this in jest. Ellie asks, Explain Sergio Roberto's renewal from a footballing perspective and also from a financial perspective. I think the latter is lost on so many. So shedding some light on that, given the difficult finances would help. I, and I, I want you to just start with a footballing perspective, because the only thing I want to add here for the footballing perspective is to calm people down. If you think of Roberto next season as taking Mingaitha's spot, plus a few extra positions because he can play in midfield as well, it makes a lot more sense where he fits, right? You think of him taking over as the starting right back for Dest and Alves and whoever Barca wants to bring in as their right back. And now we've lost the sense and that doesn't make any sense. But again, for the purpose of Roberto, it seems like he's going to be with his contract set to expire in a few weeks. He's going to be renewing for another year at 60% of his current salary. And I'll do the finances in a bit, but from a, a sporting perspective, Vic, give me the, the, the Sergio Roberto. You don't have to give me the pitch. Like if, if you're totally out on it, that even one year of him doesn't make sense, please. I, I, he, again, I, I, he is one of these players that, it, you know, he's he's been that Swiss Army knife for us in the past. He's been gone so long now. This Like, there is no example of him playing with Xavi, playing with these players. He hasn't, has he played even with Pedri? I mean, it feels like maybe the answer is no, probably yes, a long time ago, but he's not playing with Gabi. How is he playing in this system today? Um, it's just a complete unknown, but at the same time, as long as he's healthy and as long as he can actually play at a, um, a decent, you know, a level that before his injury, then what we have there is, again, we can continue to insert him as needed where we need him. And if he's willing to take on that role as probably not a starter, then I'm comfortable with it because we do need good backups. You know, when people go down and you're actually saying, oh, we have to put Mingueza in and you're like, oh, oh, goodness, you know, or we need to put in you know, this other player into this role because the other, you know, someone's hurt. I think Sergio Roberto could be that kind of like that solid veteran option backup when you need them. Um, do I want him as a starter? No. Right, right. But there might be a spot for him, as you mentioned, in the club somewhere, depending on, again, is the price is right? That's like an important thing. And I mean, that was the thing about Mengatha. Like we can hate on him a little bit, but he also was available and he also was getting paid less than 10,000 uh, 
uh, uh, 10K euros per week last year. And, you know, I want to remind people too that Mangetha for that knockout when Barcelona were knocked out of the Euro- Europa League this year, that Mangetha played right back. And people, you know, tend to not remember that because it was, you know, he was fine, but the team as a whole wasn't good enough. And he was part of that, you know, um, but he played in that game. Adama Traore played in that game. Uh, and then, you know, and then you had Sergino Dest just coming back from injury, but unavailable to play that whole time. So yeah, for the finance wise uh, of this part, Ellie, I want to say, you know, you're the one that tipped me off to the website Capology. So that has been helpful to answer this question. It's a collection of the salaries, et cetera, many of which are verified, but not all. So still be careful with that kind of website. But fortunately, Roberto's was, and it says that he sits close to around 175,000 euros a week, which puts him at the ninth highest right now in the squad. And he played less than 15 games this year. So he just wasn't available. Your ninth highest earner was not on the field this year, regardless of whether or not he deserves to be on the field, or if you think he's a starter or a reserve player, wherever you think he is, he wasn't on the field at all and making that money. And so you lose out on all that, all that, that money on the field. And he's only behind Busquets, Alba, Dembele, De Young, Ansu, Memphis, PK, and Pedri, with Ansu and Pedri's salaries, of course, being renewed ones, not the old ones. So that reflects a new one. And, you know, as far as the financial thing, like why this wanted to get done before June 30th, again, where it fits into Gabi's renewal, it actually is partly what makes his renewal kind of tough too, because Roberto was apparently making, again, 175,000 euros a week, while Gabi at the moment, of course, is making 4,000 euros on a youth contract. And Ansu's number is now around, apparently around 220, and Pedri's is unverified and is likely around 180. Araujo, who just renewed as well, is around 135 which does mean that the club kind of won that one a little bit with Araujo. So you'd think that Gabi's camp is asking closer to Pedri's number around 180 than the club. And the club wants him near Araujo because of his age at 17. They still think, Hey, this could all go wrong. And he could just be a bum by 21, which happens to a lot, a lot of 17 year olds. Right. So we'll see how that one shakes out. But I think both the player and the club want him to continue. It's just a matter of finding that number, but there's a lot of variance in that weekly number. But again, getting Roberto to sign for a much, much lower number, not as low as Danny Alves, who's 3,000 euros a week are the lowest in the first team squad. And again, a gift. But it allows the club to have a better idea of the wage bill of next season. And I think Xavi and the board, you know, plus that Catalan tax, of course, believe that Roberto on the cheap, even a 60% reduction of more, is better than another player who would, they would have to pay some additional agent fees for on a free transfer and a player who is very similar to Roberto will likely ask for more wages to offset that move to a new city, to a new club, a signing bonus, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right. So you're talking about so many more additional costs than just renewing him at lower wages. So I think, again, I get the frustration people have with Roberto, but if he's on the field and he can make 30 appearances this season for a number that is actually worth his value and worth his value as a, like as a market value compared to other players like him, then it could all work out. Again, this is another one of those Barcelona has to bite the bullet on this because of the short-term issues that they financially have. So again, if I have to take my lumps, it's seeing Roberto come off the bench. I am going to, I'm going to live with that because I have to live with that. Same thing with Busquets. We can't replace Busquets, but if we can't, but he still plays the most matches of anybody in the squad, we have to take our lumps on that one this year. 